Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Pathology Learning. I am Dr. Monica. In the previous classes, we had seen about the various events which happen in acute inflammation. So in today's class, we will be seeing about what are the inflammatory mediators which were responsible for causing this inflammation. So starting with the inflammatory mediators. We have two types of mediators which are cell derived mediators and plasma derived mediators. Under cell derived mediators, we have a pre-synthesized and newly formed mediators. So under preformed mediators, we have histamine, serotonin and lysosomal enzymes. Under newly synthesized mediators, we have arachnonic acid metabolites, platelet activating factor, chemokines, cytokines and nitric oxide. Under plasma derived mediators, we have complements, kinin system and the clotting system. So we will see one by one. Starting with histamine and serotonin, these are preformed mediators. While this histamine is going to be produced by the basophils and the mast cells, serotonin is going to be produced by the platelets. And both of these mediators have their major action on the vessels and that is why they are going to be labeled as vasoactive amines. So the, both this histamine and serotonin are responsible majorly for the vascular events which happen in inflammation that was vasodilatation and vascular permeability. Apart from that, they also cause bronchoconstriction. So moving on to the next mediator which is arachnonic acid metabolites. Arachnonic acid is a substance which is going to be derived from the cell membrane of the cell. So in cell membrane, we all know it contains phospholipids like linoleic acid. So the, with the action of phospholipase A2, this arachnonic acid is going to be derived from the cell membrane. After deriving, this arachnonic acid can undergo two pathways which is the cyclooxygenase pathway or the lipooxygenase pathway. So if it undergoes the cyclooxygenase pathway that is with the help of the uh, cyclooxygenase enzyme, arachnonic acid gets converted into various prostaglandins. So starting with prostaglandin G2, H2, D2, E2, F2, prostaglandin I2 which is also called as prostacyclin and then we also have this thrombaxin A2. So the major function of these prostaglandins especially the D2, E2 and F2 is to cause vascular events again vascular dilatation and vascular permeability. Apart from that prostaglandin D2 is also responsible for neutrophil chemotaxis. Then coming to prostaglandin E2 it has a special thing for pyrexia and pain. So remember it has P and P. So pyrexia and pain again it is going to be caused by prostaglandin E2. Then uh, prostaglandin F2, it is going to increase the uterine contraction. So that is why during labor we keep dinoprostone which is nothing but prostaglandin F2 alpha to increase the uterine contractions to proceed with the labor. Prostaglandin I2 is again going to cause vascular dilatation and apart from that it is also going to decrease the platelet aggregation. And the exact opposite of this prostaglandin's action is going to be that of the thromboxin A2's action. So thromboxin A2, it is going to be produced by platelets and it is uh, its major action is vasoconstriction and also increasing the platelet aggregation. Uh, while process cyclin was going to be produced by the endothelial cell. Okay, so both process cyclin and uh, thromboxin A2 are going to have opposite actions. Then moving on to the lipooxygenase pathway. So if arachnonic acid is going to be acted upon by the lipooxygenase, that is the 5-lipooxygenase, then it is going to form various leukotrienes. LT is leukotrienes, okay. So leukotrienes under which the major leukotriene will be leukotriene B4 and this leukotriene B4 was responsible for chemotaxis. Other than that, it also is useful for the neutrophil activation. So if you remember already in chemotaxis I had told about LIC the major chemotactic agents we have other things also but the major chemotactic agents are leukotriene B4 then interleukin 8 and complement factor 5A okay so this is one of the major neutrophil chemoattractant then we have this leukotriene C4, D4 and E4 which are going to be called as slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis and again these are going to be responsible for causing vascular permeability but here it is going to cause vasoconstriction rather than vascular dilatation okay other than that we also have bronchoconstriction as the action but if the arachnonic acid metabolites are going to undergo a 12 lipooxygenase pathway then it is going to form anti-inflammatory mediators like lipoxins. So lipoxin A4 and B4 these are anti-inflammatory and they are going to inhibit the addition step or chemotactic step of the acute inflammation. So if we inhibit 
any of these enzymes which are forming this inflammatory mediators then the inflammation is not going to proceed so anti inflammatory drugs have been developed by inhibiting the uh, these enzymes only so starting with cyclooxygenase inhibitor so cyclooxygenase we have two types mainly cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2 the cyclooxygenase 1 is a constitutively active enzyme going to be present in both the stomach and the platelet while cyclooxygenase 2 is going to be present in the endothelial cells if we inhibit the cox1 enzyme that is example is aspirin so if aspirin is given it is going to inhibit the cox1 enzyme and that is going to inhibit the production of prostaglandins in the stomach but in stomach prostaglandins are going to be protective so protective for preventing the peptic ulcers so if we inhibit this cox1 it is ultimately going to lead to peptic ulcer disease so here it is one of the side effects then moving on cox2 enzyme inhibitor like celecoxib it is a selective inhibitor which is going to inhibit the cox2 enzyme in the in the endothelial cells so here if we inhibit it what will happen obviously prostacyclin is not going to be produced remember i told prostacyclin is present in the endothelial cells but thromboxane a2 will be present because thromboxane a2 was produced by the platelets so it is by cox1 enzyme so when you inhibit cox2 alone cox1 enzyme is still active so thromboxin a2 will be produced but prostacyclin will not be produced so what will happen so uh, we already know that thromboxin a2 is responsible for causing platelet aggregation so without this opposite action of prostacyclin this platelet aggregation will culminate and then it will result in the cerebrovascular complications so side effect of this cox2 inhibitors will be cerebrovascular complications so in asthma we have bronchoconstriction so in order to revert this we will have to inhibit the mediators which are responsible for bronchoconstriction so one of the major mediators i told was leukotrienes so either by inhibiting the leukotrien receptors or by inhibiting the phylox pathway itself so the leukotrienes are not going to be produced so by this way we can inhibit the production of leukotrienes and that will prevent the bronchoconstriction in asthma patients so examples of lox inhibitors will be xyluton and leukotrien receptor antagonist will be montelukast then if uh, the major enzyme which was responsible for producing this arachidonic acid itself was phospholipase a2 remember so this phospholipase a2 can be inhibited by steroids so the major pathway itself is being inhibited so steroids are the most potent anti inflammatory substances so moving on to the next inflammatory mediator which is cytokines so we have various cytokines we'll see the important ones here so tnf alpha interleukin 1 and interleukin 6 these are majorly responsible for most of the cellular events which happen in acute inflammation like addition rolling transmigration and then activation of leukocytes and also for increasing the production of other cytokines as well other than that they are going to have some systemic effects as well like decreasing the appetite causing fever and increasing the production of acute phase reactants and activating the uh, leukocytes so tnf alpha is going to be majorly responsible for decreasing the appetite so in cancer patients if you see they are very thin right so that is called as cancer cachexia it is because in those patients the inflammatory activity will be more because of tnf alpha and this tnf alpha is the one which was responsible for decreasing the appetite okay so uh, if they ask the question as what is the uh, cytokine responsible for cancer cachexia the answer should be tnf alpha so moving on to interleukin 1 it is the major uh, cytokine responsible for causing fever already i told prostaglandin e2 is also responsible for causing fever but interleukin 1 is majorly responsible then for producing acute phase reactants from the liver it is interleukin 6 which is very important okay then moving on to the next uh, cytokine which is interleukin 17 interleukin 17 is going to be a chemoattractant for both neutrophils and monocyte macrophages then interleukin 6 10 13 and tgf beta these are very important as they are all anti inflammatory mediators so whenever they ask about anti inflammatory mediators these interleukins should come to your mind interleukin 6 10 13 tgf beta other than that if the question is not about cytokines you have to include about lipoxins as well so remember one thing interleukin 6 we said about uh, interleukin 6 both in pro inflammatory and anti inflammatory so interleukin 6 is one of the cytokines which has both pro inflammatory and anti inflammatory action 
The next inflammatory mediator will be chemokines. So as the name suggests, these are going to be responsible for chemo attraction or chemotexis. So we have four important families of chemokines starting from CX3C, CXC, CC and C. Okay. So under CX3C, we have fractalkin which is an uh, example and it is responsible for attracting the mononuclear cells like lymphocytes and monocytes. Then under CXC family, we have interleukin 8. So remember interleukin 8 was the major was one of the major chemoattractant for neutrophils. So in LIC, I standard for I stands for interleukin 8. So under CC chemokines, it will uh, attract all the WBCs except neutrophils and examples of which will be eotaxin, MCP1, MIP1 alpha and Rantus. So as the name suggests, eotaxin is for eosinophil, MCP1 is macrophage chemoattractant protein and MIP1 alpha is also for macrophages. Moving on to the next chemokine under the C family which will be lymphotactin. This lymphotactin as the name suggests, it is a chemoattractant for lymphocytes. So all of these examples along with the families are going to be important. So one other clinical aspect I would like to uh, highlight over here. The receptor CXCR4 and CCR5, these are going to act as co-receptors for HIV. When HIV comes and binds to the cell, it is going to be with this uh, help with the help of the CXCR4 and CCR5. This is again an important MCQ. So moving on to the next inflammatory mediator which is platelet activating factor. So as the name suggests it is going to cause platelet aggregation. Apart from that it is also going to cause bronchoconstriction and vasoconstriction. But in low doses it, can, it is capable of causing vasodilatation and vascular permeability as well. Then moving on to the next thing which is kinin system. Whenever there is an injury the clotting factor 12 will get activated into clotting factor 12A and that is going to cause the conversion of pre calicrine to calicrine and this calicrine is going to be responsible for the conversion of kininogen molecule into bradykinin. Bradykinin is an inflammatory mediator the most important action of which will be causing vascular events. So the bradykinin's action is exactly like that of the histamine and serotonin that is causing vascular dilatation, vascular permeability and apart from that also bronchoconstriction. So exactly as that of histamine but one other thing extra about bradykinin is it is also responsible for pain. So pain we had already seen it uh, prostaglandin E2 was responsible right. So bradykinin is also responsible for pain. So moving on to the next inflammatory mediator which is complement system. This is a plasma derived cell mediator. So all of this complement system is going to result in the formation of something called as MAC which is membrane attack complex. So for this to uh, uh, form we have the C3 convertase activation. The C3 convertase is an enzyme and this C3 convertase is going to cause the activation of C3 which will result in the formation of MAC. So for this C3 convertase formation we have various pathways like classical pathway, alternate pathway and mannose binding lectin pathway. The classical pathway is going to be activated by an immune complex that is when an antigen goes and attaches with an antibody it is going to form an immune complex and this immune complex will in turn activate the first complement that is the C1. And then the mannose binding lectin pathway here the antibody is not needed but the mannose present in the bacteria, the bacterial cell wall. So it is going to be detected by the mannose binding lectin protein. So this complex is going to directly activate the C1. Okay. So in alternate pathway here it is going to be activated because of endotoxins, lipopolysaccharides or venoms. So here there is no activation of C1. It directly activates C3 with the help of something called as factor B and properdin. So in classical and mannose binding pathway, we had seen that C1 is going to get activated. C1 will then further go, uh, is going to activate C3 convertase. The C3 convertase will activate complement factor C3. Then the alternate pathway, it is directly going to culminate in this activation of C3 only. So what happens now? C3 is being formed. Then C3 breaks down into C3A and C3B. C3A will be released while the C3B will be going to attach to the cell itself whichever is going to be activated. So it will attach to that cell which has to be killed. Then the C3B will attract more and more C3B and then that will cause the activation of this C5 convertase. The C5 convertase enzyme will then break down complement factor 5 into C5A and C5B and as known before C5A is again going to be released and the C5B will go and attach to the cell which has to be killed. 
Now the C5B will recruit other complements like C6, C7, C8 and C9 and this is going to form a complex which is labeled as membrane attack complex or MAC complex. So the most important function of this MAC complex is to cause bacterial cell lysis. Whenever MAC is going to get attached to the bacterial cell wall, it is going to form pores in the bacterial cell wall and the bacterial cell will lyse. So that is the major action of this MAC. While the C3A and C5A which were released right, so these are going to act as anaphylatoxins. So already I mentioned C3A and C5A are going to be anaphylatoxins which are responsible again for the vascular events of acute inflammation. Other than that C5A is also a chemoattractant right. So I mentioned that LIC so in that C is going to be C5A okay. So C5A is a chemoattractant for neutrophils. So C3B is going to be one of the byproducts of this complement pathway and that is responsible for opsonization. So already we had discussed opsonization is nothing but coating of the bacteria so that it is being easily recognized by the macrophages for phagocytosis. So C3B and IgG are the major opsonins which are responsible for opsonization. MAC I already mentioned it is going to cause bacterial cell lysis especially for bacteria which have a very thin cell membrane like that of a Neisseria. So how to uh, regulate this complement system? We have certain regulatory proteins like C1 inhibitor as the name suggests it is going to inhibit C1. So it is the major inhibitor of classical and the mammanose binding lectin pathway. So when the C1 inhibitor is being deficient, it is going to lead to a condition called as hereditary angioneurotic edema. So this is a life threatening condition because the patients can develop laryngeal edema and they will go in for respiratory distress and even collapse. So it is uh, necessary to identify this condition immediately and do a tracheostomy to save the life, life of the patient. Then the second regulatory protein is DAF and MERL. DAF is nothing but CD55 and MERL is CD59, its other name basically. So this DAF is going to inhibit the formation of C3 convertase. So C3 will not be formed and CD59 is going to inhibit the formation of this MAC complex. So without C3 further complements cannot be formed and without MAC the bacterial cell lysis cannot happen. So the deficiency of this DRAF and MERL is going to lead to a condition called as paroxysmal nocturnal hematuria. So we will be reading about this in detail in anemia chapter. Just remember DAF and MERL where deficiency is going to lead to a condition called as PNH. Then factor H it is an inhibitor of the alternate pathway. So the deficiency of this factor H is going to lead to a condition called as atypical HUS. So these are important MCQs so remember it. So C1 inhibitor deficiency is going to cause hereditary angioneurotic edema while deficiency of DAF and MERL is going to cause PNH and the deficiency of factor H is going to cause atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So moving on to the next inflammatory mediators which is coagulation products. So we have a very close link between inflammatory pathway and the coagulation cascade. So we all know that fibrin is the final product of the clotting cascade. So fibrin was produced from fibrinogen with the help of thrombin. So this fibrin is going to again degrade into fibrin degradation products. So this thrombin is also responsible for activating certain receptors called as protease activating receptors and these receptors are going to be present on the WBCs and platelets. So whenever clotting factors like thrombin is getting activated it is also going to activate the leukocytes. Other than that the fibrin degradation products this will also activate the WBCs. But as such also for a clotting uh, cascade to take place the vessel has to get injured, the endothelium has to get injured. So that is when the uh, platelets uh, start aggregating and then the clotting factors will start accumulating forming a fibrin clot. The same way vessel injury is also a type of injury and that injury is going to always lead to an inflammatory attraction. So always coagulation and inflammation go hand in hand. So we had seen about various cell derived and plasma derived mediators. So histamine, serotonin and bradykinin were the major ones which were responsible for the vascular events of acute inflammation. While chemotaxis, remember L, I, C, so leukotriene B4 into leukin 8 and uh, complement factor 5A. This is going to be important for chemotaxis of neutrophils. Other than that, we saw about the various chemokines. Then for fever, I mentioned interleukin 1, TNF alpha and interleukin 6, but out of which interleukin 1 is the most important one. Other than that, I mentioned about prostaglandin E2 having specific two functions, which is 
pyrexia and pain so pp then for pain again prostaglandin e2 is going to come other than that bradykinin the most important one is bradykinin for pain and substance p also again p for p then anti inflammatory mediators the most important ones are interleukin 6 interleukin 10 13 tgf beta and lipoxins in that interleukin 6 was both pro and anti inflammatory then bronchoconstriction i mentioned histamine serotonin and bradykinin all three had the same actions which is vascular dilatation vascular permeability and bronchoconstrictions other than that leukotriens that is why we are using xylitol and montelukast right to inhibit these leukotriens so that's it for today's video if you like my content consider subscribing and sharing it to your friends who might also benefit from my video thank you